Amen. That's what we pray, praise him for. That is what we sing about. That is what we highlight and celebrate is our God is faithful. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the God that we see that we've been looking at in the book of Exodus over these last couple weeks, months, that is the same God that we We'll see today and tomorrow and forever. Mm, faithful. Children can be dismissed to Children's Church, four-year-olds through second grade. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 11. We're going to look at chapter 11 and the first, well, at least the first two-thirds of chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab that. We're going to start reading in chapter 11, looking at verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they, that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Jumping down to chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Jump down to verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans to kill and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. 
For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children ask of you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, the terror felt that night in Egypt is almost unfathomable to our modern Western minds. To hear the cry of not just one or ten or a hundred or a thousand or a million, but every single household. Because you, God, had warned and they did not listen. God, we thank you even now for the Passover lamb that you offered, that you made a way for your people to be spared, to be saved, to be protected. And we know this side of the cross that you've provided the greatest Passover lamb in Jesus. So, Father, we praise you this morning for that. We worship you for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning, that you would help us to see you in this event, in this final plague on Egypt. Help us to see who you are, and who we are, and how we should respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you remember, we've talked the last couple of weeks here about how the plagues were an act of God on all of the Egyptian gods to expose them as fakes, as frauds, as phonies. Nothing more than demons parading around in Halloween costumes. But the greatest idol of all of Egypt was going to be brought to his knees this night. Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the most worshipped man or created thing in all of Egypt. You see, Pharaoh viewed himself as a god, and he, he promoted that amongst the rest of the Egyptians. He was the supposed physical embodiment of the god Ra in the flesh. And if you remember, back in chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, at the very, very beginning, when Moses first goes back to Egypt, God told him that, first off, Pharaoh will not listen so that God would get the glory. But he says, if Pharaoh doesn't let God's firstborn son, Israel, go, he warns what's going to happen. Pharaoh's firstborn son would be killed at the hands of the Almighty. And at this final plague, Pharaoh would finally let God's people out of Egypt. You see, when the Lord stepped in in this tenth and final plague, he was directly confronting the lie that has perpetuated itself and continue to be passed on all the way back from Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. That man himself is a God or can be equal to the one and only God. That we can be the same as the creator. That we should receive the worship that God alone deserves. 
You see, all the way back in the beginning, Satan convinced Adam and Eve of that lie. Just eat the fruit, and then you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Then you will be like him. And Eve looked at the fruit, saw that it was good to exactly what Satan told her. And they both took, ate, and fell. And that lie has continued throughout all uh, generations to be passed on from parent to child all the way till today. And in ancient Egypt here, Pharaoh was the one who not only believed it and bought in, swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, but actually demanded worship and servitude from all of Egypt. But the problem is is that the Lord, Yahweh, is a, a jealous God. He does not share his worship with another. But I hope as you look at Pharaoh here, there's one of two ways you can view Pharaoh. You can see him and be like, man, so glad I'm not like that. We'll have another sermon for those of you who see it that way. This morning's for the rest of us. When I look at Pharaoh, it's hard not to see myself in him. Especially myself before Jesus rescued me. Look at how Pharaoh lives. We know a little bit, I mean, if you've done any, any world history at all, whatever that is, sophomore, junior, freshman, whatever year of high school, in college, you usually have to take some world history. Egypt is usually one of those civilizations that is studied in at least decent amounts. And so when we know the things, when you think about Egypt, what's the first thing you think about? Probably a gigantic pyramid, right? Maybe a sphinx, some really cool statues, tombs, mummies, King Tut maybe. When you think about Egypt, Egypt spared no expense to ensure that their rulers were viewed as gods and that they had every opportunity to enter into what they viewed as the afterlife with everything that they might need. That's why they buried chariots and you know, mummified cats and all kinds of things and are in these tombs that we've found. Pharaoh, if anyone in the world was the exemplary uh, model for what it looks like to live for yourself. Even if it was at the expense of everyone else around him. Using slave labor, using servants to build up these monuments and these amazing um, statues and cities all so that people would remember my name. His deepest seated idol was himself. And the pyramids and the tombs and the statues and the clothing, it all pointed to Pharaoh's fantasy that the world revolved around him. But the problem is, is I see the same thing in my life, albeit on a much lower scale. I've never built pyramids. But isn't that the root of sin? The root of sin is self-exaltation, arrogance, self-centered thoughts and actions. We all live for ourselves, first and foremost. And even after the nine plagues that had already come before him, Pharaoh still held tightly on to the delusion that he was in control. He was in charge. But this tenth and final plague would leave no doubt as to who was in control. Pharaoh needed to have his greatest idol drop to its knees, himself, his own heart. We all need it. We all need to come to a place where we recognize, I'm not all that I think I used to be. I'm not as good as I make myself out to be. When I take off the mask, once I get into my home, once I look in the mirror, I recognize, man, Man, if they only knew, whew, 
Good thing they don't. What's interesting is in this final plague, really God takes the, he takes the kid gloves off. Now you look at some of these other plagues and you're like, I don't know if he had his little kid gloves on. I mean, he literally destroyed most of their livestock already. He destroyed almost all of their crops. He's already given them boils over their entire skin. He's given them perpetual darkness so they can't even leave their homes. What else would it take? Well, I think if, if you're a parent, I think you recognize the difference in this last plague. Or if you're an oldest son like I am, you recognize the difference in this plague. You know, scientific atheists have tried to reason and, and find natural explanations for all of the all of the plagues. And so they're like, well, yeah, if, if you did some, you know, maybe it pulled some red clay into the Nile River and, and then that would have, you know, taken out the oxygen in the water and, and then the fish would have died. And yeah, that would have forced the frogs out. And then when the frogs died, yeah, then that would have created gnats and, and flies would have come to the rotting corpses. And then, and then, yeah, they probably would have spread disease and, and then that would have spread to the livestock. And so they can come up with all of these so-called natural explanations for what happened. There's no natural explanation for only the oldest son in every family dying. Every oldest boy. It can only be explained as a divine act of God. And even if you think about it, Aaron and Moses, what did they do in this last one? And in, in most of them, you know, they're holding their staff. They tap the water. Moses prays. They speak. This last one, they're nothing but spectators like everyone else. God doesn't even have them do anything except warn him. And the thing that really strikes me in this final plague where all the firstborn sons are killed, the thing that's like a, you know, kind of like a neon sign flashing is the reality that the Hebrew boys were spared in the exact same way that I have been spared, by grace through faith. It was nothing except the grace of God being poured out for those boys, unearned favor. Let me explain. So it wasn't until this week when I was really digging into this passage that I recognized something. Look at verse 23. Chapter 12, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. I never really thought about it before, but the destroyer, a.k.a. the angel of death, a.k.a. whatever, the judge, claimed a right over every single home in Egypt. Hebrew and Egyptian. He visited the home of every Egyptian, and he visited the home of every Israelite. I always just thought, well, yeah, he just, you know, flew around. He probably stayed out of Goshen because that's where most of the Hebrews lived. No. He claimed a right over every home. Why? Why not do just like he did with all of the other plagues? Well, at least plagues four through nine. Why not separate out the Hebrew homes and only go to the Egyptian homes? Well, we don't exactly know the answer from the book of Exodus, but we get the answer in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we see in shadow, we see things kind of veiled. We can kind of get glimpses, but we don't see the crystal clear picture. In the New Testament, the veil is taken off, and we see in 4K high definition on the nice flat screen TV. And Paul, in Romans chapter 3, he gives us some of the answers. He says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Three chapters later, chapter 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. You see, the, the destroyer visited every single home in Egypt, Hebrew and Egyptian, because every single person is guilty before the Lord. The Israelites were not innocent. The Israelites were not, in, were not perfect. They were not sinless. And as a result, every single firstborn is worthy of death because of their own sin. And not just that. Every secondborn, every thirdborn, every fourthborn, every fifthborn, every boy, every girl, every father, every mother, husband, wife, man, woman, child. All stand guilty before the Lord. From the son of Pharaoh to the son of the lowest servant. We've all gone astray. Isaiah 53, 6. Romans 5, 12. Just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death came through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. What Paul's saying in Hebrews, or in, in Romans, is that, man, the destroyer should have just wiped out everybody if God was being fair. If he was being fair and equal, then no one should have lived through that night. All of Egypt should have died, not just the firstborn sons. And honestly, what the New Testament tells us is that each of us should get the same treatment. It's what we all deserve. And in the end, there was death in every single house in Egypt that night. So what verse 30 says. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Well, here's what's interesting, is even the Hebrew houses had someone dead. The Passover lamb. The question was not, is there death in the home? The question was, who died in the home? In the Egyptian homes, the firstborn took the wrath of God on behalf of the entire family. But in the Hebrew homes, the perfect, spotless, one-year-old male lamb took the wrath. You see, in God's mercy, he provides a means of escape from his wrath to anyone who would believe his word, anyone who would trust him, they would be spared. The destroyer would come to the front door full of wrath, ready to pour it out on the firstborn son. But when he saw, look at what he has to look for. Verse 23. When he sees the blood, he pours out mercy instead. When he sees the blood on the doorpost, he would pass over in peace. Those who trusted God's commands, those who, who believed in God's promises, they took the, the perfect spotless lamb. They'd look it all over, no bruises, no cuts, no broken bones, no abnormalities, no three-eyed lambs going on here, none with missing earlobes, nothing. Perfect, exactly the way it's supposed to be. One-year-old male. They take it into their home on the 10th day. But remember, they didn't kill it till the 14th. So what happens on day 10, 11, 12, 13, and the 14 all day until twilight? Well, guess what? That perfect spotless lamb that you brought into your home, it better still be perfect and spotless on day 14 at twilight. So you still had to feed it. You had to nurture it. You had to care for it. You had to make sure it didn't break a leg. You had to make sure it didn't get any cuts. You had to protect this lamb for all of those days. You brought it into your home, became a part of the family, and then you would kill it. My wife's, my father-in-law um, was a hog farmer many, many years, and I remember, I remember um, some stories that Rachel would tell of being a little girl, going to the hog confinement, and you know, the smallest of the smallest pigs, the runt, well, 
he would bring those home, and Rachel would get to play with it, pick out a name or whatever. I don't, do you ever name it? You didn't name it. All right, she was at least smart enough not to name it. Bring home the runt, let him play with it for a while, and then that little runt would just disappear. Well, you know what happens to the runt. If you don't, ask your neighbor. As you bring in the animal into your home, you get an attachment. You ever had to put down a pet? You understand some of what's going on here, of what God's bringing out in the people. They'd bring this lamb in, and then they would kill it, drain the blood, roast it whole over a fire, and then eat it together as a family. And with their sandals on their feet and their belt strapped, ready to go, their staff in their hand, ready to leave at a moment's notice, they would paint the blood on the doorpost and the lintel of the front door, so the sides and the top of the door, and those would be the ones who God spared. They would be shown mercy. The destroyer would not strike down their sons. You see, God provides what God demands. And we saw this as when we studied Genesis, Genesis 22, um, I think it's like seven, somewhere in the middle there, seven to ten, somewhere in there. When Abraham and Isaac go to Mount Moriah, God says to Abraham, sacrifice your one and only son, the son of promise, the son that I said you would be made into a mighty nation through. The one through whom your descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Take him and sacrifice him for me. And Abraham proves his faith in the Lord And Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that God could even raise his son from the dead because he believed that much in God's promise. But the Lord stops him as his hand is beginning to come down with the knife onto his one and only son. And he reveals that he's got a ram stuck in the thicket and the brush over here, use that for your sacrifice. God always provides what he demands. He knows his people are fickle, weak-minded sinners, unable to save themselves. He knows what's in the hearts of the Israelites. The song we sang to begin the service this morning says, Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sowed. That's the gospel. You died on the cross so that I could benefit from what you did, that I would gain your righteousness. Not because I'm great, that I'm special, that there's something in me for why you chose me, purely because you are merciful God, you are grace-filled. You see, the Passover teaches us about sin and salvation. It, It literally preaches the gospel Because Israel was not worthy of being saved. You can be pro-Israel and still recognize, man, they're messed up just like the rest of us. They couldn't save themselves. But God in his gracious mercy provides a way of salvation. You see, all they had to do was believe God at his word and sacrifice a perfect lamb in their place. And what what Scripture tells us is that that lamb, that very first Passover lamb, and every single lamb after that, all point forward to one thing. To the one true lamb of God who was slain to take away the sins of the world. As John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he points at him and says, there he is, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. I must decrease, he must increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul describes Christ, and he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Hebrews 9, 22 reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And he gets that all the way back from Genesis 3. 
after Adam and Eve took that fruit and they ate and they sinned and they fell and they recognized they were naked and they were ashamed and the guilt began to set in and they divided themselves and they began to point fingers and, and blame and they complained to God. What's God do? He sacrifices an animal to cover them with its skin. Pointing forward to the Passover lamb who would be sacrificed for them to cover them from their sin. Pointing forward to the sacrifice on the day of atonement when the lamb, one, one of them would have, would have the, the scapegoat would have his, his head touched by the priest and the priest would say all the sins of the people and they would transfer it onto that, that goat and then they'd walk him all the way out and everybody would watch. He's going all the way to the end until they can't see him anymore. And the other lamb, he would, well, he got the rougher end of the deal. He was the one who was sacrificed to take away the sins of the people. And that pointed forward again till Jesus was beaten, spit on, mocked, whipped, nailed to a cross, and suffocated for our sins. That all comes out here in Exodus the foundation is laid here. And Hebrews, he recognizes, the writer of Hebrews recognizes all of these sacrifices, the initial Passover lamb, all of the sacrifices in the Levitical priesthood system. He says the blood of bulls and goats was never able to perfect us or they would have ceased to be offered. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. But the blood of Jesus the perfect lamb, our substitute, in one single offering as our eternal Passover lamb, he has perfected those who come to him in faith, washing us to cleanse us of the stains of sin, setting us apart as his beloved children. And it was only possible because God made it possible. Because he stepped in, he made a way, he provided what was needed for us to escape the wrath that we deserve. And up until this plague, God had himself separated Israel from Egypt. God had made a distinction between them in plagues four through nine. You see, God knew where to keep the flies away from. He knew how to tell the Hebrew cows from the Egyptian cows. He maintained light in Hebrew Goshen, but not in Egypt, Egyptian homes. But now in the 10th plague, there's something different. God doesn't simply pass by the Hebrew homes just because he's like, oh yeah, that one's Hebrew, that one's Egyptian, hit it. Now one's Egyptian, get that one, Hebrew, 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 just keep going. He doesn't do that in this plague. He requires something of the Hebrew people, an act of faith. You see, the descendants of Abraham were not automatically spared this plague. Only those who obeyed the Passover commands of the Lord were spared. The blood that they painted on the doorpost was visible from the outside, it would have been abundantly clear to anyone walking down the streets of Egypt that night who was a Jew and who was not. Who believed Yahweh and who said, yeah, I think I'm, I'm actually really craving a hamburger tonight. Sorry. We're going to make spaghetti for dinner, not lamb. It was a public profession of their faith. They were confessing I am trusting in God this night. It was a visible testimony of their trust in him, trusting in the substitutionary death of the Passover lamb, that they believed this lamb was taking the place of my firstborn son. I believe it. That's why we're doing it. They believed that the blood of this lamb was going to be all that they needed to be spared the final plague. And that trust we call faith. Belief in the promises of God. That what he said is true. That things will turn out the way he said they will turn out. 
and faith responds with obedience. But here's what I, here's what I love about it. If you look at chapter 11, verse 7. Not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Well, wait a second. What's making the distinction? Is God making the distinction or is the blood making the distinction? Yes. Ha! It's like last week. It's both. Even though it was the faithful obedience of the people putting the blood of the lamb on the door that marked them as Israelites, as Hebrews, as people of Yahweh, it was the Lord who was making the distinction. Even your faith and your obedience are works of the Lord in you and through you. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, is the gift of God. What's the this? It's your faith. Your faith is a gift of God that he has given you, that you might be a distinction between the people who don't have faith and the people who do. And why does God make that distinction? Verse 9, Ephesians 2, 9, that no man may boast. Because you see, what the Israelites could have potentially done in a hardness of heart, they could have said, well, yeah, of course God saved me. I obeyed him. Like, I went to tabernacle. Well, none of these ones ever would have, I guess. But I obeyed. I did what I was supposed to. I was a good Christian. I went to church. I memorized my Bible. I read it. I pray. I tithe. Of course God saves me. You see how we can very quickly turn obedience into self-righteousness into sin. But God didn't save them because of who they were. He saved them because of who he is. He saved them by grace through faith. And it honestly, it blows my mind how much the New Testament, how many New Testament teachings are foreshadowed and alluded to in this book of Exodus. I mean, it's foundational to understanding the New Testament. It's like needing to know addition before you can do multiplication or how to measure before you can build. The Lord is the one who brought salvation. It is the work of the Lord alone. And our job is to respond with obedience and faith. But here's my ultimate question that I see arise from this passage. The question is, are you covered? Have you trusted in the blood of the lamb for your own salvation? Because, you see, there's two types of people in this world. Those who are willing to bow their knee to the word of God and those who will be bent to God's judgment. Those who refuse to sacrifice a perfect lamb those who refuse to stay in their home during the night, those who refuse to roast the lamb, those who refuse to eat the flesh, those who refuse to apply the blood to their doorpost, those who refuse to bow their knee to the word of God, they suffered the reality of God's wrath. They woke up at midnight to a dead son and weeping and wailing. They were the ones screaming hysterically over the pain of loss and the realization that it was all their fault. Yes, the Lord had done it. But they were the ones who had not heeded the warnings. I've had people ask, well, is this even fair that God poured out these ten plagues on Egypt? 
Do you remember how many warnings God gave before this tenth and final plague? He continued to tell them to repent and believe. He continued to warn them what would happen if they didn't. They ignored the preaching of Moses. They hardened their hearts, and in their hardening, they received the due penalty for their heirs, like Romans chapter 1. Even though they knew God, they refused to honor him as God or give him thanks. Now, the sad thing is, we're seeing Egypt replicated in America. Not just America, all over the world. As the hardening of people's hearts begins to push them further and further away from the gospel. And it's not as though the gospel is not being preached. It's not as though people aren't giving the warnings. It's that people say, yeah, I just don't believe it. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'll suffer the consequences later. They don't recognize the warning after warning after warning after warning that God has given in his patience and his forbearance. And yet, just like in Egypt, when God comes back and he pours out the bowl of his wrath on this world, they're going to say, well, I didn't know. Why didn't anybody tell me? If I'd have known this was coming, I probably wouldn't have done it. The warnings are there. And obviously, we know the end of the story here. But imagine you're in the midst of this whole scene. Hebrew, Egyptian, I don't really care which one you want to pretend to be. Imagine plague one happens, and the Nile turns to blood. You're probably asking yourself, okay, is this it? We've been been crying. If you're a Hebrew, you're crying out to God for 400 years for deliverance. If you're an Egyptian... You're like, oh no, the Nile's our source of life. Is this the one that changes Pharaoh's mind? Is this the time he kicks out the Israelites? Nope. All right, well, maybe the next one. Next one comes along. Frogs everywhere. Is this the one? Is Pharaoh finally going to change his mind? Nope. All right, maybe it's the next one. And you get to play four and five and six and seven and eight. And you're like, all right, God, um... I see you're doing something, it ain't working. Are you not powerful enough to force Pharaoh's hand? Are you just like playing with us? Are you the the guy with the magnifying glass burning the ants? Like, what are you doing? My question is this. Did the first nine plagues fail because they didn't result in deliverance? Were they failures because they didn't result in Israel being freed? Were they signs that God was not powerful or capable enough of actually rescuing his people? Now, obviously, from from this side of the Red Sea, we recognize, nope, that's not the case. But my question for us today is this. Today... When God works and it doesn't result in the expected, in what you expected at least, is your tendency to question, is your tendency to doubt. Well, I see you're working, God, but obviously you're not working well enough. God, you've done multiple things. I've watched you time after time after time do things, but it's not ending where you've told me it would end. Do you trust without hesitation and bow to his word every time, or do you hem and haw and ask if he's even paying attention to what's going on in your life? You're like, knock, knock, God, are you on vacation today? Did you forget? Like, are you dealing with people in... You know, Southeast Asia right now, like what's going on? The plague should be a reminder to each of us that God always works out plan A. He doesn't have a plan B or C or D or E or F. He never has to turn to plan B because something didn't go right. What the Exodus tells us is that the Passover was always plan A. Plague 10 was always intended to be plague 10. 
He said time after time that he would do many signs and many wonders in Egypt, but that God would harden Pharaoh's heart so that his name might be proclaimed and glorified. My question for us this morning is, do you believe that in your own life? Do you act like your life right now, the timeline that you've walked through, has been God's plan A for you? Whew. Or do you hold on to the lie of Satan that God has made mistakes with you? That God has forgotten about you? My encouragement to you is maybe you're just not at plague 10 yet. Have we ever thought about that? You might be in plague 3. Maybe you're at 9. But the 10th plague was achieved by one thing. The tenth plague was achieved by the coming of the Lord himself to Egypt. Look at chapter 11, verse 4. Thus says the Lord, about midnight, who is going to go into the midst of Egypt? I will, says the Lord. Chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. There is no one else. So whatever you want to call him, destroyer, angel of death, whatever, it is the Lord who is moving through Egypt on the night of Passover. It is God himself. This intervention was Yahweh stepping in to rescue his people. And when Yahweh steps in, everything changes. When Yahweh enters Egypt as absolute Lord and judge, it wasn't just Egypt who had a problem, though. Everyone has a problem when the holy God steps in. Israel's problem was no longer how do we escape uh, slavery and how do we escape Pharaoh's hard rule, but now it's, man, how are we safe before a holy, just God? And it's the same issue we have today. If God were to step into our world right now today, we would have the exact same issue. How can we stand before him? Who will cover us? See, people have all kinds of priorities today. Things they want to live for, things they want to pursue. But when Jesus comes back at the end of this age like he has promised he would do, the only thing that is going to matter is, can I stand before him? And the, the answer is the exact same today as it was for Israel. My only hope to stand before him is if I am covered by the blood of the Lamb. I need a perfect, spotless lamb to shed his blood in my place, just like Israel did. It's either me or it's the lamb. There will be death. There will be judgment. But thank God Almighty that he has made a way. He's made a way for us to be covered, to be protected, to be safe when he comes that the judgment and the wrath that I have earned from my sinful rebellion will be taken, uh, taken away from me as far as the east is from the west. That the destroyer will pass over me because he sees the blood of Jesus painted on the doorposts of my soul. So my final question for us this morning is when Jesus looks at you, does he see the blood? Does he see the blood of the lamb applied on the doorposts of your soul? Have you bowed your knees to God's word, to the truths of the gospel, to the fact that there is no other way by, under heaven by which you can be saved? If you have not, man, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know what's coming at midnight. The Egyptians were given warning. God says when he comes back, it will be like a thief in the night, echoing back to what it looked like for Egypt. Don't miss the warnings. Today is the day of salvation. 
bend your knee willingly or he will force you to bend under his judgment. We pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are not worthy of you. We're not worthy of the Lamb's blood to cover us. We are not worthy for you to step into our lives. We are not worthy of any of it. God, you know that. And yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, we praise you for that. We bow our knees willingly in worship and adoration for what you have done for us, that you have washed us white as snow through the blood of your Son, who sacrificed himself on our behalf, who took the wrath of God destined for me on him. And God, all you ask us is to believe, to trust, to submit. Father, I pray if there are those in this room this morning who have not, I pray that you would stir in their hearts, that you would grab a hold of them and not let them go. Father, if there are those who have not bowed their knee to Christ, who have not painted his blood on their souls, Father, I pray that they would do so this morning. And that as a public profession, Lord, have them, have them walk forward. We don't do that often here, but God, you know, you know the hearts and minds of your people. And we pray, Father, that you receive the glory, not us, not our neighbors, but you and you alone. As we sing this last song, Father, help, it, help us to worship you in spirit with fullness of hearts, knowing what you have done for us. And help us to worship you accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you stand with us? The Israelites, on the night of Passover, chapter 12, it says that they bowed and they worshiped him because they saw their God had brought salvation. They saw him bring salvation. They didn't even get to see the cross, but they saw that their God was a God who saves we get to see the full story. Our God is a God who saves. He offers himself. He steps into his creation to rescue us who are not worthy of it. And all that we can do is say, oh my goodness, thank you, Jesus. If you don't know that, Jesus, if you haven't beheld that God, come talk to me. You need to behold that God because someday, one of these days, he's coming back. And he's coming back as destroyer, not as savior for those who don't know him. Behold our God, bow the knee, worship him, and tell all those around you about him how great he is. Go church, go and be blessed. Behold.